Because I think writers should go into it knowing what they're going to get out of an MFA and what they're not going to get out of an MFA. Out of an MFA. And the things you get out of an MFA are invaluable. They're, they're, they're in incredible, useful things. Um, the, the most obvious thing is the degree. I mean, it is a credential and it is an affirmation thing. The, the second thing is that it gives you a chance to encounter writers of different ilk and, and, and dispositions and so on and so forth. And you're going to learn a tremendous amount for that. It forces you to do things that you would not normally do in your normal writing process. It forces you to read things that you probably would not normally do. So it's very valuable for those kinds of things. And it, in the best MFA programs, it makes you think carefully about craft. Right? And so our MFA program, the Pacific MFA program, I think is a very exciting idea. The, the low residency program is actually, um, is actually less fraught with the pitfalls that the, the residency MFA programs can have. And the, the reason is simple, at least the particular pitfall that I talked about, which is that having an existing writing life separate from sort of the day-to-day -day world of the MFA. Because once you're in the low residency program, you do 10, 12 days you know, with a bunch of people. It's intense and so on and so forth. It's only 12 days or 10 days. After that, you're pretty much on your own again and you're living the mentoring life. And you probably get more attention from your advisor or your mentor than you would get if you were in a residency program. But you also are forced to deal with your day-to-day, -day, your job, your family, all the things that don't change. Now, the residency MFA program gives you more time. It gives you a sense that everything has stopped for you to do this. But the danger is getting back to your real life in quotations, and that becomes the challenge. The low residency program tends to free you from that kind of headache. But at the same time, so, so knowing that, knowing what the, 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 the benefits that come from an MFA and the things that are not you know, going to happen from an MFA is to me the most important thing that the writer going into the program should have. And I think once you do that, then you can find the, the very kind of organic relationships that become important um, for writers and their development. I think that that's absolutely crucial. The whole project of being a poet and publishing is it's, or any writer and publishing, there's an edge of hubris involved in it, a tremendous arrogance. I mean, let's, let's look at the reality of what that means. I, I write something and then I want somebody to print 70, 752, 10,000 copies of this thing that I've written with the expectation that 10,000 people are going to read it. I mean, how important could I be that I think that I'm worth 10,000 copies of the things that I think and say uh, being done. And so, so the project is, 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 is nuts in that sense. But the, 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 the way you work through that is because you remember that you are one of the 10,000. In other words, you buy, I buy books and I want books and I want to read the stories and I want to read the poems and I'm one of that 10,000 and I don't feel exploited by that, that, that person who is producing that, but I'm grateful for that person to produce that. And so you justify it and sort of understand it in that way. But you, you are also reminded that you, you should not have any sense of entitlement about this. You know, to publish is a, is a privilege. It's a, it's, 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 a, it's a gift that you're given. The other way that I deal with this sense is, is because I, I've been really thinking a lot about the function of writing as a function of witnessing. Um, I, I heard Wole Shoyinka, the, the Nigerian Nobel laureate, um, a, about a month ago, he was in Jamaica at a festival that I run called the Calabash International Literary Festival. And he was on stage with Paul Holden Graeber and they were having a conversation. And, 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 and Paul Holden Graeber said to Wole Shoyinka, he said, um, uh, you know, he quoted from some, some work that said Shoyinka was the, um, the conscience of Nigerian society. And, and then he said, well, what do you think about that? And Shoyinka says, I'm not comfortable with that title. He says, I, I have enough trouble being my own conscience, much less to take on 90 to 100 million people. Um, and so then Paul then said, well, what others have said, you're a witness. And Shoyinka says, witness makes more sense to me. That sense that I'm a witness, I see, I engage what I see. 
Um, I give back what I see. I'm responsible for what I see. But in the retelling of what I see, I'm making something beautiful. The, the witnessing process is, is, is less burdensome, um, but, but it's personally burdensome. It's, it's, a, it's part of personal integrity. Um, but it's also about being in the place to be able to witness. It's also about knowing what to look at and knowing how to speak what one has seen. And I think the unique quality that we have as writers is the ability to speak it. I mean, many of us witness it, but few get a chance to speak it, or few know how to speak it. And that's craft, and that is experience, and that is the knowledge of writing. Um, and so for me, that, that becomes a, a more critical function. Consequently, the idea of writing a book and then trying to see that book published the, the, the kind of assurance that I get that it's a, it's a valid and, and, and perhaps even a noble kind of occupation is that I believe I am trying as best as I can to witness, to be a witness to the world, to be a witness to experience, to be a witness to beauty, to be a witness to fear and to ugliness and all the things that, that come in life. And if, if in that sense, um, you know, what, what one, one can do that. And then we are here in the now, you know, frankly, I don't know whether I'll be relevant a um, hundred years from now. I don't, you know, we, we, we imagine when we think of the 19th century that the writers that we still remember were the only people writing at that time. There's a kind of lie that we tell ourselves. Well, this is not true. There were, there were, there were just as many writers then as probably there are now, and we don't remember most of them. You know, We don't remember 90% of them. They, they're forgotten. That, I'm, I may be easily one of that crowd. Well, I believe in being absolute candor uh, with, with MFA students about what the MFA can or cannot do for you, what the program does or does not do for you. And knowing that so that when you walk into it, you know what you're getting from it and so on. And for me, the, the lesson that I think I've been dogged about telling people is you must make your MFA life separate from another life that is your writing life. And this may sound like complete sacrilege and, and the, the worst thing that you can say. But I really believe that the, the, the writers who are found who will survive having gotten the MFA and having gone three years, four years with rejection of their manuscript and they persist in writing until their manuscripts get picked up or they write a new manuscript or they write a third manuscript before it gets picked up. Those writers always had an existing life as a writer separate and apart from their MFA. In other words, the poetry that they wrote during those two, three years was not all workshopped. It was kept away from the workshop. It was kept away from the school. It was work that they kept working on. And after they, 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 they were living a life as a writer, separate and apart from the very artificial and heady and exciting and, and affirming life of the MFA. So this has always been my advice to, to, to writers, is to have a secret existence as a writer and, and to, 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 to really um, learn what it means to be in the trenches away from that kind of um, affirmation, which then frees them, frankly, which I think is important, to get the most out of the MFA as a craft process, a process of learning craft. That means that you can happily learn iambics and, and learn the trochaic and, and learn how to write pontoons or learn how to write gazelles and, or anything. Learn it because you're, you're just learning craft. That every sonnet doesn't have to be brilliant because you're, you're learning the craft. It frees you into that kind of space. And I think that's absolutely critical. Harder to do for fiction writers, but very possible, I think. I think actually should be really possible for them to have these kind of, um, this bifurcated view about, about about writing and and, the, and therefore the MFA gives you time to write the MFA gives you credentials the MFA gives you a sense of affirmation of being a writer and and if it's a good MFA program it prepares you for the life of writing that will come after it but I really believe in that separation so so that's one of the the, the, the most crucial bits of advice that I give and and that then allows my relationship to those writers to, to extend beyond the MFA program, right? And, um, and there are writers all over the world that I, that I work with. Um, and I enjoy that process. I enjoy watching writers make something of, of, of the work they're doing.